Hi everybody and welcome to Out of the Gate, Daily Racing Forum's weekend handicapping preview program. I'm Dan Ullman. Thanks so much for watching. Here's what's coming up in this week's edition of Out of the Gate. Daily Racing Forum handicappers Mike Beer, Matt Bernier, and I will take a look at two seven-figure grade one races at parks for three-year-olds on Saturday. The Pennsylvania Derby and the Cotillion Stakes for Phillies. We'll also have bonus coverage of the grade three Frank J. DeFrancis Memorial Dash at Laurel. JK is play of the day in all graded stakes pick three at Parks. David Aragona's Time Form U.S. Spotlight focuses on a long shot play in the third race at Belmont on Saturday. Plus, we'll have Nicole Russo's pedigree pick of the Pennsylvania Derby, horses to watch, best bets, and lots, lots more. So let's break out of the gate. We begin out of the gate with our horse watch segment. Mike Beer, Naira analyst, you found something at beautiful Belmont Park. Belmont Park maiden, three-year-old uh, Barahin Illman. This is a Shadwell horse, homebred though for, for Shadwell. They didn't purchase this one, homebred for Shadwell. Made its debut earlier this year at Keeneland. Ran really well, finishing third. He did all the hard work on the pace. Kieran stopped on him, gave him a layoff. Here's a second career start at Belmont Park. Sprinting six furlongs. He took some pressure on the lead and he leaves this field for dead at the top of the stretch. 88 buyer speed figure for this horse. Really uh, impressive win here in fast time. For a horse who looks like he's got some pedigree, he's got a lot of upside. This was a very, very impressive maiden win. You made me a little bit nervous when you said Shadwell Colt <laughs> until you said homebred. I don't like the ones they buy. The record pretty dismal at auction, but the homebreds are okay. Matt, you found something at Woodbine, a very promising horse to watch. Yeah, the rich get richer. Chad's got another good one. They win the grade one summer. This was from Sunday afternoon up at Woodbine, a horse called Fog of War. We can take a look at the stretch run of it right now. You can see he's down. He's the green silks, the Peter Brandt silks. He's down in pretty much a perfect position. And I guess that's the one thing. Anybody that wants to knock this trip, they're going to say he tripped out and everything worked out beautifully. I'm not denying that. But I think there's a real scenario where this horse is just starting to scratch the surface. You're going to see once he tips out, he's going to be a little bit green, pop back to his left lead at the end. And he hasn't run overly fast. He's paired up 77s in his two lifetime starts. But I think he was just getting warmed up at this point. I think additional distance is going to do this horse a world of good. He's by Warfront. The second dam is risk averse. He's going to want to run all day. I can see him developing into a Belmont Derby type next year. But first things first, sounds like the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. My horse watch is at Woodbine as well. Starship Jubilee was claimed for $16,000 in February of 2017. Since that claim, she's run 14 times, eight wins, one second, two thirds, three graded stakes wins, including a big upset last week in the grade two Canadian stakes going a one turn not about nine furlongs. I say about because as we turn into the stretch, the final time for this race is listed as 142 and change. Let's take that with a grain of salt. Starship Jubilee was ridden very well by Luis Contreras. She's usually a speed horse and she broke right to the top, but Contreras wanted no part of the lead and rested her all the way to the back of the pack. You saw her ease out at the top of the lane and she rolls past a couple of Chad Brown horses. Not easy at all on the turf in these graded stakes races. She earned a 104 buyer speed figure, and when she's good, she is very solid. Now, the E.P. Taylor would be the most logical next spot for trainer Kevin Attard, and he's on the fence right now. He's not sure if that distance is really good for her. I think with the right trip, Starship Jubilee can get that distance. I think the competition will be tougher, and I think the price could be right, even with a 104 buyer speed figure staring you in the face. That Starship Jubilee up in Woodbine for trainer Kevin Attard. Let's get to some handicapping. The grade one $1 million Pennsylvania Derby is our Saturday DRF Bets Race of the Day. Saturday's DRF Bets Race of the Day is the Grade 1 $1 million Pennsylvania Derby. Let's throw up the field. You can access free formulator pass performances for this race on the Race of the Day event page at DRF.com. And you can get expanded stakes previews of all the graded stakes races all weekend long, plus lots, lots more at video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Forum YouTube channel. Bob Baffert, Mike Smith, they've got the morning line favorite in McKinsey coming off of a long layoff. Mike, you're going to try to beat the source with another one based in Southern California. It's core beliefs who ran about two miles when he won the Ohio Derby. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, listen, there are a couple of bigger names in this race. Um, this is a really good field. And I'm not sitting here suggesting I'm way against horses like McKinsey and Hofburg. But on the other hand, you know, it's not like those horses don't have some questions to answer in this. But I just thought maybe the race went a little bit beyond them. 
and would allow me to look for a little bit of a better price. And I did that with Core Beliefs. He's number five in this race. We're going to look at his Ohio Derby now. This is uh, his, his big win so far. He was very, very wide throughout this race. You can see him on the outside. He's going to run down trigger warning on the lead. He's going to just out finish a ground saving loan seller and get up in this. I thought he ran really well in here. The race that caught my eye before this was the Peter Pan um, where he finished second, but I thought he ran the best race in that, in that spot by far. And then he came out of this race, and, and I don't know if, if you guys felt the same way, but in the Haskell where he was fourth beating 10, first of all, I don't know why he was last early in that race. Um, he wound up on a dead rail, I thought, all through the stretch. I think he ran a little bit better than it looks. I don't know. He's a price in here. I wanted to take a shot. Another horse that's going to be a price, at least on the morning line, 15 to 1 on your top pick, Matt. It's a horse that you've always been a big fan of. You have to deal with a little bit of a layoff here, but you're getting a better price than the favorite who has to deal with a layoff. Yeah, and we'll see what happens. This is also going to be the first time that Instilled Regard goes out for Chad Brown. It's been He's been in New York for some time, and it just feels like for one reason or another they've needed to give him time before they bring him back in a spot like this. This is a horse I feel like a lot of people have forgotten about because we haven't seen him since the Kentucky Derby, and he ran pretty well that day to finish fourth. His two prior starts in the Santa Anita Derby and the Risen Star, a lot of people were disappointed. I felt like there may have been excuses. I think sort of his real coming out party that at least made it seem like he could be a decent horse was we're going to go all the way back to the Los Alamitos Futurity. We've shown this about 15 times on this program throughout the course of the past year, but you get the gist here. Here he is on the outside. They threw him to the Wolves. Keep in mind, you got a good horse to the inside. He's going to face McKinsey again here on Saturday. I thought in still regard ran just fine considering that was his real first test. And I thought he did some good things early on as a three-year-old. And, and really, the question comes down to, can he move forward here off this little bit of a layoff? Is he going to be ready to go against arguably the best horses he's faced since the Derby. And at the end of the day, what kind of price are you going to get? He should be in that 10, 12 to 1 range. I'll take a chance. I have a tremendous amount of respect for McKinsey, but he's coming off a long injury-induced layoff and going a mile and an eighth for the first time. At a short price, that concerns me. I'd rather have a horse with a little bit more recency, and that's the number two, Hofberg, for trainer Bill Mott, who finished a solid third in the Belmont Stakes and then came back in a prep race for the Travers, the Curl, and we're going to take a look at that race right now. It was over a wet track. Hofberg raced wide throughout over a track that seemed to favor speed. He was one of the only horses really to make up any ground and go on and win. He's supposed to beat this very weak field of three-year-olds that day, but he does it in nice fashion and in fast time with a 100 buyer speed figure. Trainer Bill Mott wanted to run him in the Travers, but he spiked a fever. He missed some time. He missed the race. Here he is. I'm a little bit worried that the blinkers are coming on. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, but the last couple of workouts have been fast. fast Asked for Hofberg standards, and maybe it'll get him into the race a little bit more. I don't want him coming from 20 lengths out of it when they has to catch quality horses like Hofberg and instilled regard and core beliefs. Three horses that might get the jump on Hofberg turning into the stretch. We'll see if he shows a little bit more early speed with the addition of blinkers. I'm going to go with Hofberg in the Pennsylvania Derby. Nicole Russo's pedigree pick segment also focuses on the Pennsylvania Derby. We'll go to that segment right now, then we'll go to break. We'll come back from Mona Moy Girl in the Cotillion. Hey everyone, Nicole Russo coming to you for Out of the Gate from Lexington, Kentucky. The centerpiece events of this weekend are up at Parks, which hosts a pair of grade one events for three-year-olds in the Pennsylvania Derby and the Cotillion. Looking at the field for the Pennsylvania Derby, you'll see a lot of familiar names there. The comebacking McKinsey, classic place Bravazzo and Hofberg, and in still regard making his first start for Chad Brown. I want to take a look today at three others in the field who emerged as graded winners over the summer and are now stepping up against some of the divisional heavyweights. I'll just give you a few notes on them to add to your handicapping toolbox for the weekend. We'll start with Mr. Freeze, who has won three of his four career starts and is coming off this eight-length romp in the West Virginia Derby on the front end. A strong page as he steps up a little in distance and class here. He's by To Honor and Serve, who also has Alabama winner Eskimo Kisses out there among this year's three-year-olds. Mr. Freeze is a half-brother to Dilemma and to Heavenly Ransom, both grade three winners, and to stakes winner Capitano. All three, you know, ran on some different distances, different surfaces, but all three did win at up to a mile and an eighth. And the third dam is the outstanding race mare and broodmare Sabin. Axelrod won the Smarty Jones Stakes by four lengths last time out here at Park. It was his second consecutive graded score after also taking the Indiana Derby. He's really an emerging horse right now. 
He's one of the best runners so far by Warriors Reward, a son of Medaglia Doro who scored his biggest win in the grade one Carter around one turn. Axelrod's a half-brother to stakes place Trelawney, who won it up to a mile and a 16th. And this is the extended family of multiple graded winner Devoted Brass. And lastly, let's watch Core Belief, who has got some grade one mileage already. Third in the Santa Anita Derby to Justify and Bolt Doro, Second in the grade three Peter Pan. Won the grade three Ohio Derby by a nose over Lone Sailor. Then was fourth in the grade one Haskell behind Good Magic, Bravazo, and Lone Sailor. He's by Quality Road, who's in career form right now. Now, his stakes place dam only won it up to six and a half furlongs, but did produce a stakes place juvenile. A lot of multi-surface class deep in the family, and Quality Road is so versatile, I'd actually love to see this horse on turf next year. So there are your notes on the Pennsylvania Derby. Plenty of analysis of Saturday's star-studded parks card right here on Out of the Gate and DRF TV. DRF Sports Form Digital Edition, your ultimate weekly betting guide. Published by Daily Racing Form, DRF Sports Form delivers all of the analysis and insight you need for every NFL game and more than 40 college football matchups. Beat the spread with powerful trends and sharp angles. Tap into best bets, expert picks, parlay winners, and more. All for just $4.99 per issue. Get this week's edition free. Visit drf.com slash sportsform. Enter code DRF Sports. Are you a horse player looking to raise your game? For over 120 years, expert handicappers have relied on Daily Racing Form as their must-have source for news and data, featuring exclusive buyer speed figures, Time Form US pace figures, and integrated replays. DRF Formulator is the most powerful handicapping tool on the market today. Use what the pros use. Go to drf.com slash formulator and enter code DRFTV to get your first card free. drf.com. Raise your game. Welcome back to Out of the Gate. Let's throw up the field for the grade one one million dollar cotillion stakes with three-year-old fillies at parks carded as race number 10. They're going to go a mile and a 16th. For expanded stakes previews of all the graded stakes races all weekend long and lots, lots more, head on over to video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Form YouTube channel. Mike, the number two Mona Moy girl, is a deserving odds-on favorite. She has had a championship caliber level season thus far. We'll get to her in a little bit, but first I want to talk about the winner of two-thirds of the Canadian Triple Crown, the number four Wonder Godot, and she tried to extend that streak against the boys last time out in the Travers, and it just didn't work out. Yeah, they were just taking a shot there in the Travers, and, and you're right, it just didn't work out for them. Let's not be too hard on her for that one. She didn't run well in that spot, but her form leading up to that race, it's all very good, and you mentioned the two, the first two legs of that Canadian Triple Crown. She wasn't beating uh, the strongest fields in the world. She caught a sloppy track two starts back when she aired uh, in the Prince of Wales. Uh, we're going to show that race right now. I mean, she just crushed this field. Um, there wasn't a strong group behind her, but it, she looked good winning it. Um, you know, you don't have to go back that far, guys, to May 4th when she hooked up with Mountain White Girl in the Kentucky Oaks, and she gave that horse all that she wanted in the stretch. She came out second best in that spot. But she ran really well. She's got a little tactical speed to keep forward. This is a much better spot for her. Really improved with blinkers and distance. But now she's got to cut back to a mile and a 16th. And you can argue that maybe this distance is a little bit short for her. No distance really is an issue for Mona Moy Girl. Matt, she's been sensational in 2018. Sensational throughout her whole career. Yeah, I mean, what is she, a neck away from being undefeated from nine lifetime starts? She can win on the lead just off or from way out of it. She's proven that throughout her career. We're going to go back to her most recent win. This was in the grade one coaching club, American Oaks, up at Saratoga. And the runner-up and the third-place finisher from this race, they're showing up in the Cotillion on Saturday. You've got Midnight Bisu on the outside. You've got Chocolate Martini on the inside. And I understand Montemoy Girl had everything work for her in this spot where she went out there, she said soft fractions, and nobody's going to be able to run her down. But to be honest with you, and I was one of the folks trying to beat her in a spot like that, and I've been trying to beat her for a long time now, I kind of just wonder, are we getting to the point where she just simply 
superior to everyone else at this point and now maybe it's time to find out if she can handle that hike and take on the older girls the evil tasmans of the world and hopefully the elates if she ends up being okay and perhaps not just superior on form perhaps superior on pace if you watch the expanded stakes preview you'll note on the time form u.s pace projector they expect mona Moy girl to be controlling things in the cotillion mike we mentioned that this distance might be a little bit short for wonder godot but it might be perfect for midnight bisu who couldn't get to Monomoy Girl in that race we just saw a mile and an eighth the coaching club American Oaks and last time a mile and a quarter might have been a little far. Yeah it certainly seemed like the mile and a quarter in the Alabama was a little far for her. she was the big favorite in that race. Um, we'll show the replay of it now I mean it's not like she runs terrible in this race she's coming up there three wide on the outside to take a shot at this thing this pace we'll just point out was run at a very legitimate pace um, and Midnight Beast so she just stops finding in the stretch I really feel like she doesn't want to go this far um, so I'll give her a little bit of a pass for this performance as disappointing as it was at the end of the day um, the race that really makes me want to go back to her at least one more time is the race that we showed prior to that where Monomoy girl wired her in the CCA Oaks because I think a lot of people at that point feel like it was settled between these two after that race and I'm just not so sure I believe that I think Midnight Beast had a big excuse in Kentucky Oaks with a little bit of a trip in that race and I think she was compromised by the pace in the CCA Oaks one more chance to get to Monomoy girl for me for Midnight Beast. I don't want to have too much money in against Monomoy girl, but I do agree with Mike that Midnight Bizu might deserve one more chance, and she's certainly going to be a better price. I agree with Mike that she was pace compromised in the Coaching Club American Oaks. I agree with Mike that a mile and a quarter was certainly too far for her in the Alabama, especially when she was very wide on the back stretch and going into the turn. I want to see Mike Smith get a little bit aggressive coming out of the gate. Let's challenge Monomoy girl early and let's settle it at this shorter mile and a sixteenth distance. So I'll go with Mike. Midnight Bizu over Monomoy girl in the cotillion. Let's move from Parks to Laurel. The Frank J. DeFrancis Dash is next. Here's the field for the grade three $250,000 Frank J. DeFrancis Memorial Dash carded as race number 10 at Laurel on Saturday. We're going six furlongs. We have a solid field for expanded stakes previews of all the graded races all weekend long, plus lots, lots more. Visit video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Form YouTube channel. We cover every horse in every graded stakes race. Matt, you got a couple horses for courses in here. Lewis Field and Lockie, they're very well acquainted with each other. And they got the home court edge, you could argue. Yeah, they certainly do. They, they really seem to bring out their best when they're at Laurel. And we're going to take a look at the most recent race. This was the local prep for this spot down there in the Polynesian. And we're going to have a little bit of an incident as we get farther down the stretch run. But like you say, the fact that Lockie is six for eight lifetime at Laurel, eight times in the exacta. You look at a horse like Lewis Field, who's four for six lifetime, six times in the exacta. Clearly, they've got an affinity for this racetrack. You're going to see them come together here at this point. Something to keep in mind about this local prep as opposed to the DeFrancis Dash. This race that you just saw was at seven-eighths of a mile. You're turning back to six here. Who does that favor? Perhaps I would say Lewis Field, but that's still TBD. Mike, the number five, Always Sunshine, returned off of a layoff with a vengeance. This horse has had some problems with quarter cracks throughout his career, and it looks like he's finally healthy. Three out of his last four buyer speed figures are fast enough to win this race, and most recently, I thought he looked good in a restricted race at Saratoga, although I'm not sure about the true quality of that field. Yeah, that still remains to be seen, um, what happens going forward from that race. It didn't look like the strongest race in the world, that's for sure. The horse that he beat, My Boy Tate, was off a layoff, but let's look at the replay anyway. This is the the tail of the cat. This was a, a pretty nice performance for this horse. I like the fact that he got forward in this race, Dan. He sat up there three wide track in the pace and there's going to be a little bit of uh, uh, horses getting in tight there in the stretch, but he just stayed on nicely down the outside here. He's going to close this thing down at the end and go clear. Nice performance, and as you mentioned, he's come back off of a layoff this year and been running really, really well. This is a horse who started out his career with a lot of ability, and he's back in form right now. He's a horse with good tactical speed, but there does look to be one horse that's going to be controlling the pace, Matt, and that is the number one Switzerland, and we've seen this before from him in Maryland. Yeah, we, we really have. We saw on the Preakness undercard, and we're going to take a look at the stretch run of the Maryland Sprint. This is a horse, Switzerland, that early in his career was nothing more than a headache for Chad Brown. And all of a sudden, once Steve Asmussen got him, he got him going and got him rolling really well down at Oaklawn Park. They brought him up to Pimlico over that sloppy track, and he just put on a show. I thought this was a very impressive and thorough beatdown of a, of a decent field. You've got Lewis Field, who's going to finish third in that spot. He came back, and look, I'm not going to hold it against him that he couldn't run with Imperial Hint. Imperial Hint's going to be one of the favorites for the the Breeders' Cup Sprint. I think that inside draw, I know some people have said, yeah, a terrible situation. I don't think it's terrible. I think Fergal Lynch, you got one way to go. Break, 
go to the front and say, come and catch me. I agree with Mike on this one. I also like always sunshine. I understand what Matt's saying. Different situation than last time out at Saratoga for Switzerland where he made the lead and he had a real good one, a grade one caliber horse and Imperial Hint coming at him. Maybe it won't happen this time out. No caliber, no one the caliber of Imperial Hint coming after Switzerland, but I just love the hard hitting nature that always sunshine brings to the track. He's always had ability. He's bringing a string of fast races coming in here. And I think he can be a little bit more tactical than what he's shown on paper. I think he can wear down Switzerland in the Frank J. DeFrancis Memorial Dash. JK's play of the day in all graded stakes pick three at Parks. And then we've got David Aragona's Time Form U.S. Spotlight focusing on a long shot horse to consider in race number three at Belmont on Saturday. Let's go to those segments and we'll be back with our best bets for Saturday. Hey everybody, welcome to JK's play of the day. Uh, we're heading to Parks Racecourse. We don't get there very often, but this is their biggest day of racing. Obviously, the Pennsylvania Derby, uh, premier and, and one of the last big three-year-old races uh, that they'll have on the East Coast. And uh, it's always a lot of fun. Uh, West Coast Invaders showing up here. We'll talk about as we get to that race. We're going to play a pick three starting in race nine, the Gallant Bob. It's a three-year-old sprint race. Uh, six furlongs, keep in mind, the, the premier race, the uh, H. Allen Jerkins. At Saratoga is at seven furlongs. It's going to be a little bit shorter. I'm going to use three horses here. I'm going to use the three seven trumpets. Um, I, I, I've always kind of liked seven trumpets. I've always kind of thought seven trumpets was meant to be a good horse. And the run that he made last time I thought was good. His stable mate promises fulfilled. Set him up a little bit. But he was down on the inside there and was making up some ground late. And I think that he kind of could be coming into form. I think he still could get a similar pace to, to maybe not as quick, but still at an honest pace to close into. And who knows, the, the additional cutback to the six furlongs could do him a lot of good as well. Uh, War Giant, the seven horse uh, for Jorge Navarro. Uh, first time Jorge is always an interesting, tricky situation. I think this horse has some speed, fits right into the Jorge Navarro program with those fast sprinters. Uh, he's cutting back to six as well off of the seven furlong performance last time. I think he could be dangerous uh, on the front end of things. And then obviously the 10 Frenze fire a horse that we tried to get home uh, up at Saratoga. But I think this horse it, it could appreciate the cutback even further. You know, we've talked about this horse being a one turn horse. Well, now he's getting the shortest, uh, you know, typical, you know, distance you can six furlong. I think he could come flashing late, closing into some pace. We're going to finish it off with singles. Uh, Monomoy Girl, obviously, is the premier three-year-old. I think she's even better at this kind of middle distance, the one-turn mile, the mile and the 16th. I think she kind of allows the other horses into the races uh, from her talent standpoint when they go a little bit further, the mile and eighth or even the mile and a quarter if she would have run in the Alabama. I don't think that anyone in this field can beat her going a mile and a 16th. I think she should win for fun in this spot. And then going on, to the PA Derby, uh, he's been he's been out, but he hasn't been forgotten. Uh, once upon a time, McKinsey was Bob Baffert's uh, was Bob Baffert's Derby horse until he found another one that happened to win the Triple Crown. I think McKinsey's going to be tough in here. He ran a 125 time form in his early in his three-year-old career. That fits on what, what a lot of these horses are doing now, late in their three-year-old year. Now, I think McKinsey's going to be tough, and I also think McKinsey, after running really well in this spot, could be one you want to keep an eye out for in the Breeders' Cup Classic. We'll see you next week. Good luck. Hi, everyone. This is David Aragona for this week's Time Form U.S. Spotlight. It's a nice car to Belmont on Saturday, 10 races. Uh, there are two graded stakes, the Noble Damsel and the Kelso later in the card. But we're going to take a look at a maiden race that's taking place uh, early in the day. Uh, you know, an interesting race where I think we're going to find a vulnerable favorite. That's the third race. It's at a mile and a quarter on the turf. Now, we've taken a lot of rain recently in the New York area. Uh, they've taken a lot of races off the turf in the past few weeks. So sometimes going a mile and a quarter, you see really slow-paced races and sprints to the finish. I think this is going to be a truly run race real demanding test of stamina. So let's take a look at the field for this race. And the horse that's going to be the favorite is the number two course correction. Uh, I made him seven to five on the morning line. Horses that look like this for Chad Brown, they typically take a lot of money. Uh, he's coming off uh, really two races where he's been short prices and he's kind of disappointed. Uh, Two back at Belmont, he faced today's rival Rhode Island, and he went off at the, as the four to five favorite off a pretty strong debut effort at Keeneland back in April. And I was very disappointed with that May effort. Uh, he got a pretty good trip that day and just really had no answer in the lane as Rhode Island, who actually was wider, uh, ran by him in the stretch. 
He came back at Saratoga about almost three months later in uh, late July, course correction did. And uh, again, I thought he got a pretty good trip. The early pace of that race was pretty strong, as you see by the red color-coded pace figures and PPs. And he just really had no answer in the stretch. I know High Promise kind of got the, got the jump on that field, but course correction should have shown more of a late kick, and he just didn't. That 95 time form US speed figure is not that strong for this level. So I'm a little bit against this horse. I think he's had his chances, and he's facing some decent rivals today. Um, the horse that finished uh, ahead of him, too, back, Rhode Island, he's also back in this race. Now, unlike course correction, Rhode Island has not had a start since then. He's coming into this race off about a four-and-a-half-month layoff. Now, that's a bit of a concern. Shug McGahee is known to give his horses time and let them develop, but you never like to see horses take a break after solid performances. Um, his 102 time formula speed figure last time out, it's the highest speed figure in this field. I think that makes him the horse to beat off that effort. Um, I like him more than course correction. It's just I have some questions about the layoff. And I think this is a spot where we can look for a slightly better price. I'm most interested in the seven horse mini P making his first start in this country. Now, what I really like about time forming SPPs, um, in addition to the speed figures and the pace projectors and all of that stuff, is you get really in-depth time form foreign comments for horses that are shipping into this country for the first time. And I think it's really instructive to read the comments about this horse's debut at Newberry in, on May 18th, uh, because it was a 16-horse field, uh, a relatively strong field, and he earned a 97 time form rating, which for a maiden race is pretty strong. And you can see that the comments indicate that he really made a promising start to his career. He certainly bred to be a nice runner. His dam is a half to Caraconti, who was the Breeders' Cup mile winner a few years back. So this runner is bred to be a good one. Uh, a good one. Now he switches into the barn of Christophe Clement. I'm not going to hold his last start against him because that was a race where they just got a little too ambitious. They stepped him up to the Group 3 Hampton Court. Hunting Horn, who won that race, of course, came back and was third in the Belmont Derby earlier this year. So he just was never going to be competitive that day. Now they're getting more realistic. And Christophe Clement, as I said, he knows how to win with these types. And I think this is an interesting new face in a race where the favorites might be slightly vulnerable. So I'm taking Mini P in this spot, hoping for a price around 3-1, to one, um, you know, in the face of the two favorites. So, uh... Mini P for me in the third race at Belmont on Saturday. Now let's send it back to the studio. Time for our best bet segment here on Out of the Gate. Matt, you've got something on the DeFrancis Dash undercard on turf. Yeah, race number six. There's a lot of stakes races all throughout the card at Laurel on Saturday, predominantly on the turf. This is one of them. The all along stakes for Phillies and Mares a mile and a 16th. If you're a little bit, um, if you don't like to see horses kind of not go by and not get the job done, then this upcoming replay of his skis is probably not going to be something for you. We're going to take a look at her most recent start. And the problem is this has become a thing for his skis. She's been here for Grand Motion on five different occasions. She was overmatched in two of them, the Robert G. Dick Memorial, as well as the New York Stakes at Belmont. But the other three, she hung like a chandelier, and this has kind of been her M.O. The reason I'm going with her at odds of 8-1, to one, the blinkers are going on. And look, if the blinker's going on, don't get her to focus and finish the job, then I don't know what to tell you. It's not gonna work, but she's loomed up in basically every one of her starts where she's been reasonably placed and she hasn't been able to punch through. I'm hopeful the equipment change gets the job done. Mike Beer, Naira analyst. You've got a horse that's equally good on turf and dirt and looks like a prime contender early in the Belmont card. Yeah, Small Bear. It looks like he's going to be an okay price in this race, too. Race number two at Belmont's a one-turn mile. Small Bear spent most of the last year racing on turf, and he is a pretty good turf horse. There's a stakes win in there. He's held his own in some really tough spots. They went back to dirt for the first time in a while last time at Parks. He finished second to a streaking Aztec Sense, who races for Jorge Navarro, has won eight of his last nine races. Couldn't catch that horse, but he ran well. Let's go back and take a look at a replay. This is the last time that Small Bear raced on dirt at Belmont Park, and this is a little allowance race, and he just wins this race for fun. Off the pace, he split horses at the top of the stretch, and he rolls away from this field. I like this horse. He's fine on the turf. I like him as a dirt horse, though. I think the one-turn mile is good for him, and I think he lands in a race where there's not a lot of pace on, so he can't get out run early, but this is the kind of race that I think he fits really well, and he's a square price on the line. He's always been an underrated horse. He's always going to go off at a good price, and he usually gives a good account of himself. My best bet's at Parks on the Pennsylvania Derby undercard. It's the Gallant Bob Stakes, and I think Engage is getting some class relief, dropping out of the grade one H. Allen Jerkins at Saratoga. In his last couple of races, he had to deal with Promises Fulfilled, who is a streaking sprinter, arguably the best three-year-old dirt sprinter in the country. And we're going to go back to that Vanderbilt last time out. Promises Fulfilled got away with, an, I thought, an easy first quarter mile. Engage the number three made the first move at Promises Fulfilled as the pace was heating up. He'd take a good, strong run at Promises Fulfilled. 
fulfilled and he just couldn't get by and he got tired at this seven furlong distance, which I think is just a little bit too far for Engage. Engage is dropping in class, he's cutting back to six furlongs, and he's facing a morning line favorite in Forense Fire that might be a little bit better at slightly longer distances. Four to one on the morning line for Engage. I think we might be able to get five to two on him in the gallant Bob Stakes. We thank you so much for watching Out of the Game. We urge you to follow all of DRF TV's offerings on Twitter at DRF Video. And for the latest news and notes from America's Turf Authority Daily Racing Forum, follow on Twitter at DRF Inside Post. That's it for this week. Best of luck when your horses break out of the game.